And we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Nadav Greenberg. Nadav Greenberg is the Outreach and Media Associate at Just Vision, coordinating and managing screenings, workshops, and other events throughout the U.S. and internationally. He has been involved extensively in conflict resolution efforts and human rights work. And he is here to talk about Just Vision's new documentary film, Budras, which opened last night at the Varsity Theater. Start out and uh, tell us a little bit about Just Vision. Sure. So Just Vision uh, has been around for seven years now. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization with a team of Palestinians, Israelis, North Americans, and one Brazilian. Julia, the director of the film, is Brazilian. Um, and we are engaged in telling the stories you don't hear on the nightly news about Palestinians and Israelis pursuing nonviolent solutions to the conflict uh, and to the occupation. So you often hear about sort of the worst, the most militant sides of each society. Um, and it's very important for us to give a platform to those um, who are coming together nonviolently um, and, and, you know, actually doing grassroots work on the ground. It's happening all the time, every day. Um, so we tell their stories. We do it on our website, justvision.org, and we do it through our films, uh, Boudreaux and our previous film, and Counterpoint. All right. So tell us, what was the motivation in producing Boudreaux? Right. So when we were uh, touring around with our previous film a few years ago, our previous film was in Counterpoint, um, that was a film that uh, told the story of Israelis and Palestinians, each of whom had lost something dear to them as a result of the conflict, whether it was a loved one or land or liberty, um, and from their grief, how they try to pull their societies uh, towards reconciliation. Um, and as we were touring around with this film, we kept getting the question, um, you know, where is the Palestinian Gandhi? Or we'd hear a statement... Um, if Palestinians pursued nonviolence, there would be peace. Whereas on the Palestinian side, we'd often hear people saying, you know, we've tried nonviolence, it doesn't work. Um, so, you know, we saw this sort of gap in perception on both sides, and we recognized that um, things are a little more complicated than that on the ground, and we wanted to really tell this story, a, a success story, uh, of a nonviolent movement um, that had happened in Palestinian society that brought Israelis and Palestinians together and to really look at all the nuts and bolts of how coalitions were built, how this uh, movement worked, um, and you know, to show that there is such a thing as a nonviolent movement that can succeed um, in, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, and to you know, just really delve into that story, into all its details. That, that's kind of the genesis of where Boudreaux came from. So for those that don't know, then Boudreaux is the name of the town. Of the village, yes. It's a village of uh, 1,500 inhabitants. It's in sort of the Ramallah area, very, very close to the Green Line. You can actually see views of Tel Aviv from the village. So it's, uh, um, and it's, it's an agricultural village that relies very heavily um, on its olive trees, uh, which is why uh, the barrier going through it was going to be so serious for the village, because it would have cut it, off, cut it off completely from its livelihood. All right. And who are the, the primary people you focus on in the film? Right. So we focus on a few Palestinian and Israeli protagonists who are, um, you know, who, who are really the center of the story. Um, it, it, I mean, it is a character film. It was very important for us. What's, what's powerful about documentary film is that you can connect people to a narrative. Um, and, you know, so often we hear about this conflict in terms of, you know, big stereotypes, generalizations, or, or very typical images you see. And we wanted people to actually have faces and names and characters to relate to this because they're there. Um, uh, the protagonist, I mean, the, ma the main protagonist uh, is Ayed Murar. He is a Palestinian community organizer from the village of Budrus, who, um, when, um, you know, when hearing about the Israeli army's orders to... Um, to confiscate the lands and the olive trees so that the barrier could go through, uh, decided not to sort of give up and basically organize the entire nonviolent movement within the village. I mean, he, he, he began putting that together, building the coalitions. Um, another very central uh, character in the film is uh, Iltizam, his daughter, his 15-year-old daughter, uh, who is a remarkable woman, uh, and she actually brought the women of Budrus into the movement. Uh, one of the very unique things about Budrus, uh, this isn't the first place it happened, but it was a very strong presence there, was full participation of the village's women in these protests, um, which totally changed their tenor and uh, I think was a huge part of their success. So Ayad and Iltizam are two very central characters, uh, two, two central protagonists of this film. Beyond that, the Israeli activists we follow, there's uh, Kobi Snitz, who's um, one of the uh, central Israeli activists who is present, so we interview him. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they're incredibly courageous. One of the 
you know, most beautiful parts of the story is that there were incredibly courageous Israelis that crossed over at the height of the Second Intifada, you know, it was the height of the violence in 2003, 2004, uh, to support the villagers in their struggle, to support a nonviolent movement, um, and to show that grassroots efforts can happen on both sides. So Kobe um, and the other activists are central in this film. And then there are um, the, uh, the protagonists from the Israeli military. You see Yasmin Levy, who is a border patrol um, a policewoman. She, it was very, very important for us to include her perspective in the film to get sort of her personal thoughts on what being in the village of Budrus was. And um, I think, you know, often our interviews with her are what audiences find most interesting about the film. They find her a very fascinating character. Um, and Doron Spielmann, who is the Israeli military spokesman, um, who, you know, gives sort of the um, Israeli government, the Israeli army's version for why um, you know, the barrier had to go the way it did and, and what, um, you know, the consequences of that are. So that's, those are kind of the main protagonists of the film that we follow. All right. So talk a little bit more about the wall that's going through uh, Budras. Um, it's an extensive wall that uh, is going throughout uh, Palestine, supposedly for the protection of the people of Israel. Right. So, um, you know, the barrier is in a way a central character in this film. Um, and uh, it was, in the case of Budrus, going to cut uh, the village off uh, from its, you know, like I said, its livelihood, its olive trees. Um, it was also going to cut through the cemetery. It was going to pass right by the school. So it was really going to wreak havoc on, on the lives of these villagers and essentially destroy the fabric of life in the village. Um, it's you know, the section that was going through Budrus is part of a, you know, a much larger, longer serpentine path of this barrier, which in many cases uh, cuts away from the Green Line and goes deep into the West Bank. Um, and, um, you know, this film is not a film that tries to tell the entire story of the barrier. It's a film about a nonviolent movement in a particular village um, and, and, you know, how that nonviolent movement fights back against sort of oppression. Um, and that oppression is manifested through the barrier in this case. But we do not go sort of into the, uh, the deeper reasoning um, about the barrier in general. Um, I will say that when doing, re doing our research about sort of the serpentine path, um, we interviewed, um, and this is not in the film, but this is, uh, you, you can see these resources on our website. We interviewed um, a group of highly decorated Israeli generals, retired Israeli generals called the Peace and Security Council. Um, who had actually been the original advocates for the idea of a barrier in the first place for reasons of security and separating populations. I mean, they had, they had wanted to sort of, you know, Palestinians will be there, we'll be here, and that's how we'll move forward towards kind of a, a more peaceful future. Um, it was from a perspective of separation. Um, when they actually saw the path that was proposed by the Israeli government, um, they took the Israeli government to court um, and, and won in a case that actually happened after the story of Budrus. I mean, Budrus had nothing to do with a court decision. That's important to emphasize, but this, it was called the Beit Suri case. Um, and Shaul Arielli, one of these central generals, um, w when asked about, you know, why the path of the barrier is such, um, he, and this is a direct quote, said that security was sacrificed on the altar of the settlements. Um, so, I mean, when you look at the path of the barrier, there are cases where it's about security. There are clearly cases where it's about land grab. There's cases where it's about topography and water. There's many different reasons for the path that it takes. Um, but uh, in this film, we wanted to reflect specifically on, you know, it's the segment of it that went through the village of Budrus. All right. And so the original plan was for the wall is going to cut the people of Budras off from the olive groves that are like right down the hill from them. Is that right? Right. It, they're, they're part of the village. I mean, they're right, you know, they're adjacent to the houses of the village and the cemetery sort of is, is right next to those olive groves. So talk about the significance of olive trees in these olive groves. Sure. And um, you also see this in the film. I mean, it's one of the first things we start with. Uh, you know, Budras is a very small village. Um, it relies almost wholly uh, on agriculture for its livelihood. This is doubly true um, in recent years when less Palestinians have been able to go into Israel to work because of, you know, the, the changing circumstances, the intifada and, and the closures and all of that. Um, so, um, you know, li li livelihood completely depends on these olive trees. There's also an emotional connection beyond that, of course. Um, you know, in these villages, uh, they're, especially when you talk to the older villagers, I mean, these trees have, they, they say it in the film, they give the trees the names of their mothers. I mean, this is, this is, there's a very, there's both a, 
um, a subsistence tie to, into these uh, trees, but there's also a very emotional kind of visceral connection to them. So, I, you know, for me personally, one of the hardest scenes in the film is seeing on one of the days when trees are uprooted, um, it, it, it's horrible. You see it in the villagers' faces. I mean, it, it, it really cuts deep into their, uh, into their emotional state. And these trees are, my understanding, I'm not sure about the specific trees, but generally all of the trees uh, grow for hundreds of years. Is that true? Yeah, I'm not sure about the exact lifespan of, of but yes, I mean, they're, they have been there for, for years and years. And uh, I mean, they've been a part of the village um, as far back as anyone there remembers. So um, that was, you know, when seeing plans for them to simply be uprooted and moved to areas where they couldn't access was, you know, it was, it was like a, a death proclamation for the village. It was a horrible, you know, it was a horrible piece of news for them to receive. And I think that's a lot of, that was a catalyst for them to organize in the way they did and protect it. So, uh, talk a little bit more about Ayed Marar, his history prior to the um, the bulldozing of the trees in his town. He had been involved with politics a little bit. Yeah. So Ayed Marar actually currently uh, works for the PA, uh, the Palestinian Authority, um, and he had been involved, you know, in Palestinian national movements in the past. Um, he'd actually been in prison for for activi- you know, for his activism uh, in the first Intifada. Um, and he, um, you know, he's very committed to um, civil organizing, to nonviolent resistance. This had been something that he grew up with. Um, he is an incredible, he's an incredible man who is very much about building coalitions, very much about local organizing. I mean, he's a community organizer in the full sense of the word. Um, this is the background he came out of, and um, it was it was crucial for him uh, when he saw this to put together, um, you know, a movement. That is not that is not just something brought from above. That is not brought from the Palestinian government. Um, you see this tension, by the way, in the film, um, in the sense that the local organizers are often very uncomfortable with the way the Palestinian government co-opts the movement or tries to make it seem like you know like it's its own achievement. Um, so I had, I mean, he comes from a very democratic kind of uh, approach, and this is also discussed in the film of uh, not leading everything himself. I mean, this was a collaborative effort in Woodruff. It was. Uh, it was collaborative both within the village in terms of the different families that participated. And, and, and you know, what, what's amazing about Budrus is that the village turned out consistently over 10 months. That's a, another huge part of its success. Um, and, I mean, he was also democratic in terms of um, delegating, you know, he, he did not want to be the central figurehead that ran this movement. I mean, this was, this was a movement of many different people. Um, and, of course... What's incredibly unique about it is his call for Israelis to come over, his invitation for Israelis to come over into um, the village. I mean, this is uh, not an easy step uh, in Palestinian society, which is under occupation, where often uh, working with Israelis, you know, is, is not looked upon well. And I had recognized that there are many positive things that can be done together at the grassroots level between civilians. Um, and so it's, uh, it was an incredibly... Uh, un- un- unique thing of him to do to to invite those uh, activists over and for them to come. Did he reach out to uh, Israeli citizens from the start, or did that happen um, after? Because this was like a almost like a year siege. It seemed like yeah, it happened. It happened through about ten months. Ten months was the time frame. Um, he reached out pretty early on. I'm not sure exactly what the date was when he made that first appeal, but that was, I mean, Israelis were certainly part of this for, for the bulk of, of these demonstrations. Absolutely. So uh, talk more about his daughter who uh, became key to bring uh, the women into this battle. Right. So Iltiza Murar, uh, I had, at the time she was 15 years old, um, you know, saw these demonstrations going on. And uh, in the film, you see it. She asks her father if the women can join. Um, and, you know, in true community organizer fashion, I had said, if you want the women there, organize them. And she did. Um, and uh, the women, um, like I said, played a crucial role in this. I mean, they turned out, you know, the entire, basically all the women of the village turned out for this. Um, and they were also the first, the women were the first contingent of the demonstrators that managed to actually get beyond the Israeli army's lines and stop the bulldozers. I mean, literally get with their bodies in front of the bulldozers. Um, this, uh, you know, it, it changed the tenor of the demonstrations because at the time the Israeli military did not know, uh, it was used to seeing, you know, Palestinian boys in front of them and they dealt with them the way that the Israeli army, you know, sometimes does. And um, in this case, this kind of took the army by surprise and the women's participation was uh, was 
you know, crucial in that sense. Um, you know, there's a scene in the film, and I'm not going to give away too much, but there's a scene in the film where Iltizam, you, you actually see her go beyond the lines and take that first step. Um, and that was kind of, I think, a turning point. It was a turning point in terms of um, what the villagers and, and, you know, all the demonstrators realized could be possible um, in terms of, you know, personal capacity, um, you know, versus an entire occupation and what you can do and how, and how a demonstration like this, how nonviolent resistance like this can work. Um, and I also think that, you know, when you have young Palestinian boys faced with young Israeli soldiers, male, you, you get very, um, you know, the escalation happens very fast. Part of the reason we've seen so much violence in the region um, has to do with this kind of escalation that happens that everyone's already used to and, every, and tempers run very high. Um, once Iltizam brought the women in, um, it completely changed things. I mean, for one thing, the Israeli army brought Yasmin in, who is a, a woman, you know, policewoman. Um, and there's a very interesting dynamic that happens with, you know, Yasmin coming in as, um, you know, a Israeli woman looking for empowerment in the army. I mean, she makes a point of the fact that she wants not to just do a desk job in the army. She wants to, you know, and from her perspective, she wanted to go in and defend her country actively in the army. Um, and then there she is faced with uh, Iltizam in an olive grove. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating dynamic that develops. And I think it really, it kind of took everyone by surprise and was a huge part of how this movement succeeded. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, amazing footage in the film. I mean, you and your and everyone involved in it just seem to be in the right place at the right time like throughout the film. Talk a, a bit about, there's a bunch of footage of Budras before these groves are taken out, was that archival footage? Did you know this was happening uh, mm -hmm. ahead of time? So, I mean, we are incredibly grateful um, to have worked with many of the activists who had been on the ground at the time of the protests, um, who um, actually filmed a lot of this at the time and who were you know, kind enough to share their footage with us. They were not there to make a film. They were there to document you know, what was happening on the ground. They were there for human rights purposes. They were there with cameras. Um, and, you know, many of them facing deportation, facing arrest, got this incredible footage um, because they felt it was important for, for, for this to be seen, for these stories to be told. Um, and we were able to compile, um, you know, many, many, many hours of their footage, um, you know, which, which is sort of the base for the film that you see. Um, we, at the time when these protests were happening, were actually working on our first film in Counterpoint and came to this story sort of as it was wrapping up. Um, and we have, you know, I'd say about half of the footage in the film is our own footage um, that we've done, you know, interviews and other things from Village Life and things like that. But uh, the footage from the activists is a crucial part of this. And, we're, and they're active, they're Israeli, Palestinian, international activists that we work with. Um, it, so we're incredibly grateful to them for... Uh, for giving that to us. There's also uh, numerous uh, footage of these escalations or these um, where the people are doing protest or a march and then the Israeli soldiers are responding to that and there's back and forth movement and the camera people are like right in the middle of this. I mean, literally mm -hmm. you can watch like one group move out and then the soldiers come in and, and the camera people appear to be relatively untouched. Was that like... Um, special arrangements or working relationships that were developed between the camera people and everybody involved? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the, the villagers and the, uh, you know, the protesters, there were, de I mean, the people filming were activists. They were an active part of this and they, they, they were very special relationships that developed over time. I think you see that in the film. I mean, it was one of the important things about Budras was this was not just people that came in for a day and sort of got a tourist's view of what it's like to be in a nonviolent uh, demonstration. This, these, these were definitely, uh, you know, cultivated relationships that that have, that have, that took root and continued on. I mean, um, as you see at the end of the film, I mean, they continued on to other uh, villages. This was something that 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 carried forth. Um, in terms of um, the footage you see of the military, I mean, that was. Uh, there, the, the relationships there were less deep in terms of uh, connections between camera people and the military. But uh, I think this was this was before um, the military uh, understood as much in terms of what would be done with the footage. I think there was less. I think today it would be much harder to get that type of footage. Um, given, I mean, this was this was 2003, 2004, and I will say that we don't date. Um, 
you know, when this happened in the film, because we didn't, th this is very much an ongoing process. And where, whereas, you know, most of the events in Budrus happened during those years, uh, this has definitely been an ongoing movement that has since spread to other villages. Um, you know, debates continue, and the film is now part of that narrative. I mean, we premiered the film in Ramallah, um, in Pal you know, in Palestinian society this past summer, and over 700 people came. It was an incredibly, you know, positive screening. Queen Noor of Jordan attended. Uh, it was her first time ever in Ramallah. It was incredible support for the film. And since then, we've had requests from over 40 Palestinian villages, many of whom are similarly threatened by the barrier, um, to uh, to see the film, to use it in their discussions and their strategies about how they're going to build their movements uh, to, to protect their villages from the barrier. So, I mean, this is, it's it's been... Um, you know, it's been a movement that's spreading and it's been something that um, not everything that was possible in Budrus would be possible today, but it has definitely, it, it's definitely something that is an ongoing process directly from there. We can tie it back to, to things that uh, happened in Budrus. It's also interesting seeing footage of where, uh, I think we've all seen footage of young boys throwing rocks at Israeli soldiers and you can see different instances of that throughout the film, but then the locals, women coming out and tell, trying to get them to stop, you know, mm -hmm. stop, to, so they're trying to de-escalate what's happening there. Right. I mean, yeah, stone throwing is a very complicated issue. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's, there is a debate about it within these movements, within the villages, about, you know, the role of stone throwing and whether it should be done or not. Um, I can tell you um, that in the case of Budrus, uh, you know, when the village planned and strategized and thought about how to do these protests, stone throwing was not part of the strategy. Um, but, you know, often things escalate on the field and often tensions flare. And you see that. I mean, we don't, we don't try to hide that. I mean, that is something that happened. Um, I think one thing that's very important to understand about stone throwing, I mean, and this is especially acute to me. I mean, I, I am an Israeli personally, so this is uh, you know, we're a diverse team at Just Vision. We have people from many different backgrounds, which makes makes it very interesting to do this work together. Um, but um, stone, you know, stone throwing is perceived very differently on both sides. You know, for on the Palestinian side, stone throwing is sort of the one symbolic act of power of someone who's completely oppressed and crushed by this massive occupation, um, and it's the one thing they can uh, it's the one thing they can do to to be heard, to be seen. Um, Whereas on the Israeli side, stone throwing is very much perceived as a violent act. It's, uh, you know, stones can hurt, stones can sometimes even kill. So there's, there is a gap in perception um, over what stone throwing constitutes and how violent it is. Um, and it's something we, we, tr we try to recognize both sides of this in the film. We try to show that. Um, and that, you know, that, that gap in perception it plays a very central role in, um, you know, debating how these nonviolent movements are going to grow, how they're going to spread. Um, but like I said, often, um, you know, for strategic, for pragmatic purposes, um, the, the planners of the protests often do not start from a place of advocating for stone throwing, um, but things get messy uh, on the ground. Um, and that's part of the reality of these movements. Another thing I, I want to say is that a nonviolent movement um, does not mean the absence of violence on the ground. I mean, it's, I think we often look back at some of the famous nonviolent movements of the past, whether it's India or... Uh, things like that, and we tr we tend to think of it as big kumbaya moments where where things you know where pacifism prevailed. Um, ultimately, I mean, a nonviolent movement is confronting a society, um, you know, con confronting its perceived values with its actions on the ground. Um, that's an uncomfortable process. It's a messy process. I mean, um, I'm and as, as an Israeli, I'm uncomfortable watching what happens, but I think that's a necessary step on the way to such a movement succeeding. I mean, it's uh, for, for a society that has perceived democratic values to implement those on the ground. I mean, it has to go through a very, um, a very painful process of looking itself in the mirror and seeing that. Um, and in that process, yes, there is, you know, there's, there's violence that flares up. There's uncomfortable things that happen on the ground. Uh, tensions run very high when that kind of, uh, when that kind of holding up a mirror happens. Um, so, that that's all part of the story that we that we put in the film. Do you know what the uh, Israeli soldiers were told prior to coming into that situation? Um, no, I don't. Uh, we we don't have that information. Um, uh, you see, at some points in the film, some orders they were given and some guidelines, but uh, there was not. I think 
I think it's clear from the footage that you see that there was a lot of confusion um, and a lot of surprise in what the soldiers faced. Again, I mean, I'll say it again. I mean, a lot of these soldiers went into the army with a very clear purpose of doing, of, of defending their country and suddenly saw a very different uh, reality in front of them. Um, and different soldiers reacted in different ways. I think you see that in the film. I mean, in some cases it caused to, uh, it caused escalation, it caused, you know, the, the discomfort of being in that situation caused people to get even more violent. Um, in other cases, it just, it, it caused bewilderment. I mean, you see that, uh, you see that in, in the faces. So it's, yeah, it was definitely present. All right. So what do you hope to accomplish with the film? Um, our purpose is to change the conversation in this country um, and in Palestinian and Israeli society about what nonviolent movements can achieve. Um, and um, I will say that the response to the film has been fantastic on all those levels. I mean, we, uh, the first place we showed the film was the village of Budrus. We took it back there. It was a very important screening to us. It was an amazing screening. They were in, the village was incredibly enthusiastic about the film. We showed it on the actual girls' school on the side of, of the girls' school that you see in the film because there's nowhere else to show the film there. Um, and uh, from there, we took it sort of on a tour of the world and of the region. We, we premiered it. Our, our world premiere was at the Dubai International Film Festival. Um, it was a red carpet gala. Uh, the first night was Avatar. The second night was us. So it was, uh, they had to kind of get the 3D equipment out of there at the last second. But uh, it, uh, it was very successfully received there. Queen Noor was there to, to give us a special recognition. And... Um, uh, from And actually, I will say that in Dubai, uh, one of the most interesting things to see was, um, you know, these, the sight of these Israeli activists was incredibly unique for the Arab world to see. I mean, I don't think the Arab world has access to an image of an Israeli like these activists. I mean, there's such a, there's such a one-sided kind of look. I mean, the Israelis that the Arab world is often exposed to are only soldiers or only settlers. Um, and uh, seeing the reaction was a very, very interesting thing for us, uh, Just Vision, to see. Uh, you know, some people even thought we made these activists up. So there was, there was definitely that reaction. Um, from Dubai, you know, we took the film to Berlin. We won an award, an audience award at the Berlin Film Festival. Our North American premiere was at Tribeca, where we also won an award. Um, and since uh, we've been playing around the country, I mean, we're, we're here in Seattle now and we're going to be playing in San Francisco and in many other cities around the country in coming weeks. Um, and at, at the same time, we're playing, like I said, we're showing this film um, across, in round, across Palestinian society. I mean, we've had requests from many villages to see it and within Israel. We've played it in theaters, um, you know, around Israel, the art house theater chain, the Cinematheques in Israel have played this. Um, we've had screenings in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, um, even in Sderot, which is the city which uh, is often attacked by rockets from Gaza. We had a very, uh, a very significant screening there where reservist soldiers who actually served in Budrus came to the film and then stayed for a very, uh, you know, hard-hitting 90-minute discussion, um, which, you know, we, we, we really appreciated their participation in that. So... Um, we've had, we, you know, we've had, this film has been generating a lot of debate. And one other thing that I'll say is that we're about to launch our community and campus campaign. So sort of taking it beyond the theaters and taking it into schools, into, uh, you know, congregations, um, and really bringing the debate to the most local, personal level where we feel that's where the conversation is really going to get changed. Okay, with that, we're enforcing out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thanks a lot.